let's raise a hallelujah. Amen. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my
a joy to worship with you this morning. As we do each week, will you turn to somebody new this morning and greet them? says this, hallelujah, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights, praise him all his angels, praise him all his heavenly armies, praise him sun and moon, praise him all you shining stars, praise him highest heavens and you waters above the heavens, let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were created. Church, in blessing and glorifying God, we are ushered into his presence. And it is there that we find unspeakable riches and joy. And it's in that sacred place of praise that we are reminded what our calling and our purpose is. Just as Pastor Spence preached a few weeks ago, we are made to worship. We are called to worship. Therefore, we bless God because it's what we're made to do. We bless him because we need to. We bless him because scripture calls us to. And we bless him because it not only encourages us, but it also is commanded of us in the word. So this morning, let's join together, church, and lift our voices in adoration and praise for our God, for he is the source of all good things. Amen? Amen. So we're singing a new song this morning called Bless God. So let's do these songs.
worthy of all our praise, mercy. Man, what a joy. I said this in the other two services, but what a joy it is to worship with you all this morning, to hear your voice bless our God. He is so beautiful, so worthy of our blessing. And you know, it's not just with our voice and with our song that we can bless the Lord. It's with our whole lives. We can, out of obedience, respond to the great gift of the gospel to our lives in many ways. And that's our hope for you here at Mercy Church. We want you to follow God with all of your life. And maybe for you today, a step to consider taking is that of giving of your money to this gospel work here at Mercy Church. Bless God until it costs you something. And maybe for you, this is a step you've already taken before. And you come in here every week and we get up and we talk about this, this, this opportunity for those, of, uh, those in the room that haven't taken that step to give and, and you just sort of tune out the person up here. And that's okay, right? Like that happens to us, we get caught up in the routine, but I wanna encourage you, not just today, but in all of our future gatherings, anytime we talk about giving of our finances, to use that as an opportunity to just think of your gift that you give so faithfully. Think of it as an offering to our God, as a blessing to the God who's blessed you. And if you've never taken that step before, we've made it very easy for you. You can do it in many ways, and we want to help you take that step however we can. Now, if you're new here and this is your first time or you wouldn't call this place your church yet, man, we're so glad that you're here. We don't expect you to give to this work. Instead, we want to offer you a gift, a gift of a handshake or a high five from a friendly person at our Next Steps area outside and an actual physical gift is a token of our gratitude for you coming and checking out a, a, this church. It's a big deal. We really want to help you take your next step in following Jesus, and so you can learn about that at the Next Steps area. Maybe you've been around for a while, and there's a different next step that's important for you to take, and that's to dive deeper into God's Word. And I'm excited to tell you that on September 16th, the week of September 16th, we're going to be launching our men's and women's fall Bible studies. This is an opportunity for you, if you're a man or a woman, which is everybody, to join others like you and to dive deeper into God's word. This is an opportunity to supplement the life of community group, which you'll hear a little bit about from Pastor Spence in a minute. And just to go deeper, we want you to become a disciple that loves God, loves others, and loves the world. And the Bible is such a great and rich place to learn how to do that. So we want to encourage you to take that step. You can sign up online. September 16th starts soon. Men's and women's. Go get it. Okay? All right. Okay, well, let me pray for us to transition into receiving God's word, and you can go ahead and grab a seat while I do that. Father, we bless you. We bless you because you have blessed us so abundantly, and we praise you. This entire thing that we're doing this morning, this is for you, Lord. May you smile on us. May we be a sweet aroma to your worthy and beautiful name, and may you Form the mouth and words of our lead pastor, Spence, as he comes up here and opens your beautiful word and shares with us from his life and from his learning. Lord, fill him. Use his voice, Lord, and tune our ears and the ears of our hearts to leave this place transformed because of your word. We believe it. Would you do it? In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Mercy family. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, um, 
Two things that it's just that kind of season in the life of the church. There's a lot going on, and I want to highlight just a couple of them because they're such a big deal to us. The first is Group Link happening today uh, during every service at all of our campuses right outside. Uh, if you guys go out there, man, we believe Community Group is a really big deal here. It's not just a program of Mercy Church. In many ways, it is the extension of Mercy Church where we know one another. We are not trying to build an audience here. We're trying to build God's church and trust God to build his church. And one of the ways we do that is we know one another, right? We have people that know us, know our stories, and we know theirs. That's a huge deal. It's where you use the gifts and experiences God has given you to bless others and they bless you. Your walk with God, your discipleship is meant to be done in community. And community group for us is where that happens. So uh, please check that out if you are not currently in one, all right? That's a big deal. Second thing, September 22nd. I need you to make sure you are marking your calendars for September 22nd. Normally, we are one church that meets in three locations, and we have seven worship services that happen across the weekend between all those three locations, all right? But on September 22nd, we're going to gather as one church in one location at one service time, okay? That's going to be at 1030, and it's going to be at Ovens Auditorium which we are pretty excited about one service time, everybody under one roof together. I think it's going to be really encouraging for you guys. Look, I love that we are kind of uh, in proximity to our community by having three campuses where you can invite your neighbors and friends that are a little bit closer to you. But I think it's very important for Mercy Church to see one another as one church. I want you to see the church that God is building and be encouraged by it. So we're going to be at Ovens, but here's the deal. There are not just enough seats for everybody at Mercy we rented ovens because we have enough seats for everybody at Mercy and then everybody at Mercy to get a plus one, okay? So you can invite one person, what we say all the time is, somebody that's far from God but close to you. If we don't, it's going to feel awkwardly half empty there, okay? That's because we're making room for us to invite our friends. We're starting up a new series called The Great Pursuit where we talk about God's love for the nation. So what you can do, action step, go to mercycharlotte.com slash ovens. Um, Ovens Auditorium asked us to make this a ticketed event. Now, tickets are free, okay? So we just, they asked us to do it so they know how many people are coming. So I need you to do it. I need you to do it, like, not while you're driving there on September 22nd, okay? I actually, like, do that sometime soon, maybe now. And maybe what you can do is go ahead and reserve one for that friend, and then you text me, like, hey, I already got your ticket, so you have to come with me. You know, they kind of feel an obligation. I don't know. Whatever you want to do. But the point is, go ahead, reserve that, and, man, be pray prayerfully inviting folks uh, to that. I think it's going to be awesome. With that said, let's jump into our text, Exodus 17. If you got your Bible, if you're new with us, we're walking through the book of Exodus, uh, specifically chapters 12 through 19. We are following God's people as they follow God in the wilderness, all right? In the wilderness. And what we've said is, uh, for kind of a takeaway, big idea for our series is, the wilderness is God's workshop. The wilderness is God's workshop. We can all agree wilderness is not enjoyable. It's painful, right? It's hard. We've said that it's a way to describe wilderness as a time of pain, disappointment, or suffering where we don't know when it's going to end. And we've all been there. Maybe you're there now, right? Maybe it's a life situation, personal life. of a, Maybe it's an injury or an illness or a relationship change. Maybe it's related to wilderness at work, like you got to overlook for the promotion that you deserved and you felt like you earned. Maybe it's, you know, we're heading back to school. Maybe it's parenting a teenager as they're going through a different stage and it feels like wilderness right now. Or maybe you just arrived at college. College students, we love you. We're so glad that you are back with us. But I know going on campus, especially for the first time, you freshmen can feel like wilderness. I mean, the dining hall alone is like, what is this? It's wilderness, right? Whatever it is, in that season of wilderness, what we are saying, the perspective we're pulling out of Exodus is that's God's workshop. He's using this time to shape us in some way if we'll lean into it. Like, I don't know if you've been in uh, like a wood shop or metal shop or something like that. I got a buddy, he's got a wood shop in his barn, right? Shaping a raw piece of wood into a finished piece of, piece of furniture, it's like, I mean, it's loud. It requires cutting, sanding, wood clamps. It doesn't sound like a spa in there, right? If the piece of wood could talk, it wouldn't be like, ooh, this is nice. No, be like, ow, man, that hurts, right? That's a lot of times what wilderness feels like. But I believe the testimony of this section of Scripture is that God will use the wilderness to form us, but that doesn't make it easy. Last week we said the testimony of God's people recorded 
throughout the scriptures and really highlighted and zeroed in in this section is if we will lean in, what we will see is God will provide. Our God will provide. And really today, as we go over to Exodus 17 from chapter 16, really today's, I haven't really like put a sermon title out there or anything, but if I did, it would just be God will provide part two. Okay, that's what we're going to see. We're going to see it again. Instead of providing bread like last week, he'll provide water. So we're going to walk through 17, 1 through 7, just seven verses, all right? Be pretty brief in terms of verse count, but man, it is packed, packed with implications for us. Because I think there are two different mindsets we can approach wilderness with that feel like they've been highlighted for a few chapters now, and I want to draw them out and lean in, okay? In wilderness, we can either have a, I'm going to praise and bless God in wilderness, or I'm going to blame God in wilderness, One of those two things is going to start to grow in our hearts over time. Are we going to choose to bless God, to praise him, or are we going to choose to blame God? I think we're going to see those two things on display in here, and it's a warning to us to choose to praise God and lean into what he wants to do in us. So I'm going to give you two practices at the end of this to help you praise God and strengthen your faith in the wilderness, and one really awesome truth to hang on to. But first, let's go through the passage, see what God has for us as we walk through it. You guys ready? Let's go. All right. Verse one. The entire Israelite community left the wilderness of sin, actually pronounced sin, moving from one place to the next. According to the Lord's command, they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Where you see sin, like I said, pronounced sin, because I don't want you to think that this is a metaphor for like a moral rejection of God right here. Uh, This is just a geographical location and probably connected to Mount Sinai, where they're heading right now, okay? Um, They say, you know, what it says in here, not they say, what it says in here is they're moving from one place to the next. Catch the words in here. I'm going to say that a lot today, but according to the Lord's command, you got to remember something. The Lord was visibly with them the whole journey, the whole time. And that's something that's kind of unique about our God, different from the God of other religions. He is both transcendent, which means he is wholly other. He is exalted, set apart, infinite in power. The Lord God Almighty up in the heavens, El Shaddai, Hebrews 1, 3, upholds the world by, the, by his own power, right? He is that God, but at the same time, he is imminent, which means he is right there with his people. He is both set apart, transcendent, but also imminent right with his people. In other words, he is separate from us, but he has chosen not to separate himself from us. That's a beautiful, powerful thing about the God of Christianity, about the the God of the scriptures. It's amazing. It's what we're seeing in here. And I say that to say that God, listen to me, who is all set apart and all with his people, that God, when they came to Rephidim to the place with no water, the God who's been in charge the whole time, who never leaves them because he's right there with them, that God led them there to the place where there was no water. God, let that takes a minute for me. And that's why I'm like slowing down here. God took them to a place with no water. I don't like it. I don't like to think of God. Here's, I don't like to think of God leading me to a place of difficulty. I like to think of, well, when I wind up in a place of difficulty, God's going to provide and help me get out. But to think that God led me into a place of difficulty... I struggle with that, but that's what's happening here. I I pause because, listen to me, college students, one of the reasons we see college students, we see high school students graduate from a home where maybe they were taught the Christian faith, they go off to college and they leave God behind, is because nobody ever made room in their theology for a God who is still with them, who still loves them, who is still in control even when bad things happen. And what I think the Lord is trying to say to us in this whole series is that the wilderness is not a surprise to him. Nor is it evil of him to bring you where he has. He's the God who has plans for you, who will never leave you or forsake you. And the notion, hear me, that because your circumstances are bad means that God is bad, really just means your theology is bad. Okay? So I hope what we're about to see now will encourage you in your faith in the wilderness. Look at verse 2. So the people complained. Okay, first of all. That could be like if you've got a, what's the most common phrase we've heard in Exodus 12 through 19? It would be the people complained, which is why it's so relatable to us, because we're like them. All right, the people complained to Moses, give us water to drink. Why are you complaining to me? Moses replied to them, why are you testing the Lord? 
But the people thirsted there for water and grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you ever bring us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Not exactly being demure and mindful, right? <laughs> Something very different. They are, no, they're loudly complaining. They're angry. And this is their go-to, by the way, go-to complaint. Why did you ever bring us out of Egypt? They love this one. They, but catch it. Slavery that we knew was better than freedom, but we're not sure where God's taking us. I'd rather go back to my old ways because at least it was familiar rather than trust God out here where I don't know where he's taking me. I'm telling you, man, there's so much for us relatable in here. And I want to pause to say right here, here at verse 3, this is the second time Moses has recorded right in this section of Scripture that they've been without water. All right? The first time is at the end of Exodus 15. They've just come out of the Red Sea, three days journey. They got no water. So what I want to do is I want to take a little flashback, okay? We're going to travel back in time and in your Bible, just back over a chapter to Exodus 15, all right? The end of Exodus 15, we'll start in verse 23, where we see this happen the first time. Verse 23, they came to Mara, but they could not drink the water at Mara because it was bitter. That is why it's named Mara. In other words, Mara means bitter. So the people grumbled to Moses. See, there they go again. What are we going to drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. He, when he threw it into the water, the water became drinkable. God provided. In fact, God goes on in the next verse to make a promise to them that he's not going to give them the illnesses like he gave the Egyptians, no plagues for Israel. He says if, if they will obey him, verse 15, uh, verse 26, he says, For I am the Lord who heals you. What a name. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals you. And I wonder, do you believe, do I believe that the same God who takes you into a place without water is the same God who heals you? Like, do you trust him? Look, some of you, I know you're split open in the wilderness right now. This is the, both the blessing and burden of pastoring the Lord willing for a long time in the same church, right? I just know your stories. Those of you that we've gotten to know each other, I know your stories, you know mine, some of you are split open right now. Your heart is hurt, and instead of walling off to the world and to God, I think God wants you to open your heart to him, to the Lord who heals you. There's this old, uh, I shared this with you before if you've been around Mercy for a bit, but there's this old form of Japanese pottery making um, that's called kintsugi, right? The idea is once you make the pot, you're kind of halfway done. You've got this clay pot and it's done. Then the next thing you do is they drop it and break it, and then they melt down a precious metal like gold or silver, and they use that precious metal as like a glue to build the pot, piece the pot back together. And once it is formed a second time with that gold going through it, like veins going through it, it's way more valuable the second time than it was the first. And I think that's a good metaphor, good picture to help us understand something like Psalm 147, where he said, he heals the afflicted. He, the one who's transcendent in others, the one who binds up their wounds. If you will lean into God in the midst of your wilderness, he is forming something, shaping something, redeeming something in you that's going to be a valuable, valuable testimony of his glory and goodness in your life to so many others. Will you lean in to him in your hurt? Will you lean into Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals? The next place they journeyed from that was this, still in chapter 15. They journeyed to, it's really cool, um, a, a place called Elim where he gives them rest from the harsh desert. This is 1527. They came to Elim where there were 12 springs and 70 date palms. And they camped there by the water. God takes them to an oasis. This is awesome. That, this is important to remember. They didn't have anything like that in Egypt. And I'm sure at the oasis, they were like, woo, praise the Lord. Like, he's good, right? Look how good. What's being revealed in Israel is they're not yet worshiping God. They are worshiping their circumstances, and they're using God to improve their circumstances. And God's trying to get them to see that he, his presence with them is the best circumstance. Whether in the oasis or in the desert, Wherever he is, that's the best place to be. That's the best circumstance. All right, now, that's chapter 15. Chapter 16 was the manna we looked at last week. So now jump back over. Let's go back into our chapter 17, okay? Back to this waterless camp. 
They're following the God who's provided so many times, specifically given them water before. They've been in this situation before, and the God who provides, the God who heals, the same God who is with them is with them now, but they don't bring any of that to mind. What comes to mind? They start grumbling. Because sometimes present thirst can blind our memories to his past provision. Right? That, that present pain in the moment, that present need, that present thirst can blind our memories to God's past provision, to how good and faithful he really is. I think one of the things Moses is trying to get across by writing this right alongside the bread and the other water and the Red Sea and the plagues, like time after time, is to say, will you trust the God of your past when your present times are difficult? Because they're going to be difficult. Will you trust the God of your past? the God who made the way of salvation for you. Will you say with Job, after he was stripped of everything, Job 121, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the next verse says, throughout all this, Job did not sin or blame God for anything. He didn't blame God. Job says he gives and takes away, and I'm not going to blame him for that. And I hope some of you need to see that you can ascribe providence to God without ascribing blame to him. You can say he's in control without saying he messed up. Blame is you passing moral judgment on God, saying he's acting in an evil way. And the scriptures warn us, James 1, 1, 13, against that. Job doesn't blame God. He blesses. He praises God. I told you, two perspectives today. Are you going to choose to bless God in the wilderness or blame him? See, to say I bless God believes God's good plan is in action. God is good. His plan for me is good, and it's in action. I blame God, says, I believe you messed up. I believe you messed up. Which way will you go? Israel should say right here, I trust him. He will provide. He led us to date spring, date trees and springs, and he led us through the desert. He's the Lord, our healer. The wilderness is not his punishment. It's his workshop. He's clearly doing something, but instead, when thirst kicks in, it signals problems. When need kicks in, it signals problem for them. When it should signal opportunity. So it should be happening. So many of us, y'all, we want the miracles of Exodus, but we don't want the wilderness that they come in. We love the testimonies of those who have been in the wilderness and the Lord saved them or the Lord healed them. Um, I sat this week with a member of our church named Mark. Back in March, um, Mark had a stroke that was so bad, um, like goes to the hospital and everything, and the doctor comes out, tells Kim, his wife, he is not going to make it through the night. That's the most likely thing here. If he were to survive the night, he's going to be have like permanent brain damage. Is not going to function right and everything. And Kim, she said, I just, I know what else to do, so I prayed. Lord, either heal him completely or take him home. And that's what she prayed. And y'all, this week the three of us sat there laughing and celebrating God's healing mark, healing work in Mark. Um, they're in their living room as they were getting ready to go out to dinner with their community group. Right? Like, the Lord has healed him. And when I say the Lord is our healer, he raises his hands. He says amen because he's experienced the healing power of God. The two of them have grown closer to each other, closer to the Lord. And the irony is for many of us, we want to experience that kind of healing power, but we don't want the pain. We don't want that pain. We want water, but we don't want a thirst. We want miracles, but we do not want to be candidates for miracles. You catch it? But what does Paul say in Romans 5? He says, I will rejoice in our afflictions. You see the change of mindset from pain equals problem to pain equals opportunity? I'm going to rejoice in my afflictions because of what? It's going to produce. It's going to produce endurance. That's going to produce proven character, and that character is going to produce hope, the kind of hope that won't disappoint. Will you lean into him? Nobody here is saying it's easy. This is not the kind of sermon, sermon series, or Bible, or God that we serve. that would say life is going to be easy peasy, as my dad would say. It's not going to be that. But man, there's a beautiful, good work God is doing in the middle of it. It's awesome. What a gracious God. What a gracious God. Let's see what the Lord does. Verse 4. 
Then Jesus cried out to the Lord, what should I do with these people? (laughs) In a little while, they will stone me. The Lord answered Moses, go on ahead of the people, take some of the elders with you, take the staff you struck the Nile with in your hand and go. Watch this. I am going to stand there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. When you hit the rock, water will come out of it and the people will drink. And then it's awesome little just summary. Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. This is what a gracious God. Like what Israel deserved was for God to go, don't worry about what you're going to do with these people. I'm just going to wipe them out, hit the reset, try this thing again, right? That's what they deserved. But instead, God blesses them with water. And I want us to look into the details of these three verses, four, five, and six. Because in the details, I think there's so many good implications for us. Let me say something. Um, This is going to sound silly, if so obvious. When you read your Bible, I want you to you go home tonight or tomorrow. I want you to read like all the words that you're reading in a passage. Okay? Here's what I mean. Sometimes, if you've read the Bible before, like if you Christians who have been around church, Christianity a little bit, maybe you've read your Bible before, you, you could just skim through something like, oh, I've read that. And you could miss something that God might have for you in there. Scripture says that this word is living and active, which means there's something there for you today. And I'm telling you, in these three verses, just look at some of the stuff that's here. It's awesome. First, look in verse 4. Um, no, verse 5. Yeah. Those of you who will be called into spiritual leadership, he tells Moses and the elders, go first. Man, that is true for pastors and ministry leaders as well. There is a follow me as I follow Christ mentality to ministry and reality to ministry. So to those of you that are aspiring to vocational ministry, church leadership, uh, of, of any kind, leading a community group, whether you are or you're about to or a ministry team, are you ready to go first in following the Lord? Not to wait and see what others do, but to go first. First in obedience. First in trusting him. First in sacrifice. Man, I'm telling you, the hardest thing about preaching isn't Sunday morning necessarily. The hardest thing is going through the text all week and sitting before the Lord and asking for the Lord to convict me so that I don't bring something to you that I haven't gone through myself. That's hard stuff, but that's leading. Next, I want you to say, look at it. God says, take the staff that you struck the Nile with. Oh, that's the same instrument that took water away from God's enemies he's now going to use to provide for his people. It's awesome. Why? Why is he doing it? Because the Lord wants to be abundantly clear on who is providing. It's the Lord. He's the one who gives and the one who takes away. Next, th- this just this is a wow moment for me. Where is the Lord in all this? Standing on the rock that Moses is going to be hit is going to hit at Horeb. Another name for Horeb is Mount Sinai. This is where Israel is going to camp. Moses goes up on the mountain, gets the Ten Commandments and everything. This is an important mountain, and God's going to be right there, right there. Amazing. Time after time in Scripture, God connects his power to his presence. He does it. In fact, in the New Testament, after Jesus ascends, but the Holy Spirit hadn't come back yet, God's like, just wait. You're not going to be able to really do anything until the Holy Spirit is with you. So I just want you to wait for a little bit. But then I'm coming. I'm sending the Spirit. And when he comes, then you will have power, and you'll be my witnesses, Acts 1-8, to Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. But you need my presence in order to have my power. And what is the great hope for me and you? If you are in Christ, you have the Spirit of God with you. You have the presence of God with you. So the steps of faith he's calling you to take, you can't do them in your own strength. But thanks be to God, he is with you, empowering you for them. So, so good. Moses did what God said. We presume the people drank. But this little scene, this gets me, verse 7, it doesn't end like you might think it would. You might think it would end with people praising God. Hey, we got water. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. Nope. Instead, this is how it ends. Look at this. He named the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites complained and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? He renamed the area of this little wilderness spot they're in. He renamed it testing and complaining. Like that's Massa and Meribah. It's like testing and complaining because they kept on complaining. Some of you are like, I now know what to name my house because my kids keep testing and complaining. You know what I mean? Like that's what's happening here. They keep testing and complaining. And Moses chooses not to name it the Lord provides the water or something like that. No, it's testing and complaining. And Moses tells us the words they use. Is the Lord here or not? 
Are you here, God? I mean, are, are you here? Do you care about what I'm going through? Their complaining came from an assumption that the Lord's presence would mean easy circumstances. And because that didn't come out the way they wanted, that's why they complained. You catch that? They thought God's presence with them meant the circumstances would be easy. And this is big because this is what they got wrong. This is what brought on their, their, what turned their suffering into despair. And I say that some of you are suffering right now. And one of the great realities that um, I'm thankful to the Lord for is many of you are coming out of hiding in your suffering. You've been suffering alone, and now you're coming, and you're saying, hey, I'm, I'm in wilderness right now, and I need some help. Praise God for that. Uh, I'm thankful you're trusting God in your church enough to take that step. And what I want to promise you is as you take your next steps, the Lord is with you. That question Israel asks, is the Lord among us? If you are in Christ, the answer is definitively yes. He's with you. He is with you you. He's not abandoned you. Wilderness is not enjoyable. It's painful. The fact that we don't know when it ends piles on. I just want to offer you the hope that God is with you. He was with them the whole time, and he is with you as the Lord your healer. Now, I want to take the last just few minutes. I told you I'd give you those two practices and one truth to help strengthen your faith, to lead you towards blessing God and not blaming God when you're in the wilderness. And here's the first one. To strengthen your faith in the wilderness— you got to practice remembrance. Practice remembrance. Let me explain what I mean. This is threaded all throughout the wilderness. It's, it just kind of like, I feel like it comes out right here too. God said, take the same staff that you struck the Nile with. God's calling Moses and Israel to remember the time where he did a mighty work. The first of the plagues, God moved. And he's saying that same staff is going to be powered by that same God because that God is standing right there with you. And man, because God calls us to cast our cares on him, I pray the Lord's going to, I, I pray it. I pray the Lord delivers you quickly from the wilderness that you're in. But until he does, and even after he does, the way to be strengthened and not to lose heart, not to fall into blame and bitterness, is to actively practice remembrance. Actively practice it, because the present thirst has a way of making us forget past provision. We so quickly drift to, is God among us? And when I say this, let me, let's get practical here. What are some ways that you can come up with that are visible, verbal, some ways that will draw you, draw your family's heart back to celebrating the faithfulness of God? Because it's one thing, and I think it's a good foundation to know the script, to know the Bible. So you know intellectually the verses, you can call them to mind that God will provide. But it's another thing to build on that by looking back and feeling all of the emotions connected to that time God has provided. Um, you know, normally if you are familiar with Mercy Church, it's not your first time, normally I've got a, a podium that stands right here, and today i got a table and a jar of rocks. Um, this jar of rocks, if you've been around Mercy, you've heard me reference before probably a couple of times. Um, this jar of rocks was given to me uh, by my wife as a uh, birthday gift a couple years ago because, you know, you get to some point in marriage where you're like, here, here's a jar of rocks. You know, we just, I don't know what to get you anymore. You know, no. It actually was probably the best gift, uh, that's why I've referenced it, the best gift that I think um, I've ever gotten. Because on these rocks, on each rock is written a different name. And um, either a name or just a, a single word that Courtney said, man, th these are our stones of remembrance. These are the times that we can look back on as a family and say, God was faithful and he met us there. Some of them are really good. Um, there's mercy. You guys are, are good. Like we took a step out. We're like, are we going to plant a church? Is God in this at all? And God was faithful. All four of our kids are on there. Uh, there's one called Fletcher. That's the first home that we had when we both quit our jobs and moved to seminary. And it's like, uh, uh, okay, Lord, we're out here trusting you. Uh, and the Lord provided there. But the one that uh, honestly just pulled it out in the 8 o'clock service, and I've been using it um, the past two since then. But this one written on it is... Uh, the name Ray. And this is not an easy one. It's God's providence, but that's the name of the daughter that we lost to miscarriage. Um, <laughs> three services. This is hard. Um, not, wilderness is not easy. Again, knowing you guys, I know some of you have been in, been in this kind of stuff. You lose someone that you love, didn't get the chance to know her, right? Um, that was hard. Going to the hospital and then the doctor sending me to go 
get some medication for Courtney while she's in the hospital and I'm in my car and I'm just like, I'm yelling at God in my car. Um, not easy, y'all. But we chose, it was so cool of her to be the one that wrote this down. We chose, all right, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. As hard as it is to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. And the Lord met us. And the Lord carried us when we couldn't even get up off the ground. The Lord has provided for us. He really is the Lord, our healer. Not all wilderness, again, actually, let me go back. All wilderness is not easy, not pleasant. But man, God does a work in it. And what I'm telling you is some of you have already been there. And you have seen the faithfulness of the Lord. And you could write it down. I don't know how you're going to write it down. For us, it's this jar. And the point of it is it stays on our dining room table most of the time so that we can see it. And it stays half empty or is half empty for now so that we can continue to fill it with more testimonies of God's faithfulness over time. What's that going to be for you? You know, a little later after Israel settles, God is going to tell them to put the law on their doorposts and put it like as frontlets on their eyes, like hanging down in their face. Put his testimony everywhere. When Moses crossed the Red Sea, he set up stones of remembrance. When Joshua crosses the Jordan, he's going to set up stones of remembrance. When the tabernacle is put up, it's going to be right in the middle of the camp so that God's presence is central to everybody's field of vision. So where is the testimony of God's faithfulness made visible in your life? Or, and I say that, like, are you just trusting and hoping that your heart will recall it? Why not make it visible? You are inundated with information. You, I mean, every generation now, we're just getting more and more just inundated with information all the time. And you're getting information, by and large, ain't going to matter in two hours, let alone two years. So instead of scrolling through things that don't matter and lead your heart to envy, why not scroll through the testimony of God's faithfulness to you and your family that leads your heart to worship? Let that be our posture. Maybe your assignment today, just go home, take out a piece of paper, and just, you're like, oh, I'm not creative. Well, just go home, take out a piece of paper, and start making a bulleted list of where was God faithful to you. Here's the second practice. Along with practicing remembrance, bring other believers along with you. To strengthen your faith in the wilderness, bring other believers along with you. I don't want to stretch Moses and the elders too far, but what we're going to see in chapter 18 um, is God is going to make it very clear Moses ain't meant to do this alone, right? And none of us are. That's why we beat the drum of community groups so much. You need people that you can go to and you can say, I am in the wilderness and they aren't going to be intimidated by it. Like, oh, I thought we were supposed to have it all together all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? You need people that are not going to be intimidated by that, who are ready to lock arms with you. And that's going to take some time to build those friendships. Some of you have friendships that should be that way, and you're just not there yet. And you need to take a step coming out of here. Because what you need in the wilderness, you know this, you need somebody that sometimes, because what you sometimes need is somebody to just come, you're sitting in the dirt, and they, you just need them to come sit down in the dirt with you. Put an arm around you. Hey, I'm here. Let's sit in the dirt together. But sometimes when you're sitting in the dirt, you need someone to come along and lovingly pick you up, kick you in the rear and say, let's go. Let's follow God together. Right now. How do you know which one is which? That's why you need a close friend who loves the Lord and who loves you to help figure that out. And you walk together. Right. That person who does that, that's a good friend in Christ. Those are the two practices. Let me give you one truth. It's so remarkable to me to help us close. The remarkable truth here is as we read this from the lens of the New Testament, which is what believers are called to do, is interpret the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. Here's what we'll see. Jesus is the rock who gives us living water that will keep us from ever thirsting again. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul makes it very clear and, and talks about this moment, I say very clear, helps us understand this moment and what we're supposed to take away from it. He talks about it, and here's what he says that in 1 Corinthians 10, 4. They, Israel, drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. In fact, there's, it's kind of a mixed bag on this. Some historians believe that the rock was, uh, was of the size that they could carry it around with them, and they kept carrying it on the journey, and it continued to pour out water. I don't know for sure, but what I do know is the meaning of the rock. And the meaning of the rock is that it was Christ. And from Christ flows living water. And he talks about this 
in the New Testament in several times in the Gospels. We see it, right? John 7, he invites us to come receive the water of life. Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. What's he talking about? He said that about the spirit. Those who believe in Jesus are going to receive the spirit. The water of life is the Holy Spirit who will be with us, who will sustain us in the wilderness until we stand with Jesus in glory one day. God said to rock, though, listen, back in Exodus 17, the rock had to be struck in order for water to come out. Same is true of Christ. Until Christ the rock is struck by the appointed hand of God, mankind is left to thirst and die in the wilderness of his sin. But thanks be to God, he didn't leave us there. He did not leave us to thirst and die. No, he struck Christ on the cross, and from him flowed forgiveness for our sins. But not only that, what do we say? Acts 2, from him flowed life through his Holy Spirit, who now resides in all who are in Christ. The Holy Spirit goes with us every step of the way. The Holy Spirit supplies hope in times of hopelessness, strength when we have none left, patience and forgiveness when we've run out. He's the friend who never leaves, the God who says, I'm with you always, even in, especially in your wilderness. And that's the invitation to all of us today. You know, the final invitation in the Bible, you've been around mercy, you know, this is one, a verse that I love. It's the final summons of God. It's so actionable. It's Revelation twenty two seventeen. Both the Spirit, Spirit of God, and the Bride, that's the church, say, come. Let anyone who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty, even if that's you here today, come. Let the one who desires take the water of life freely. Freely. Do you desire the water of life? It is a free gift. You simply have to come. Does your soul need to be refreshed? Come. The rock has been struck. The water now flows. God has not made a mistake with your life. Your situation is not outside of his loving providence. And I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying you can bring your pain and your suffering, your wilderness to him and receive the water of life. Receive refreshment for your soul. Receive the Lord who heals you. Let me pray for you. I'll lead you in a time of prayer, actually. If you're a Christian, I want you to respond, uh, invite you to respond with these two practices. Maybe it's taking a minute and recounting the faithfulness of God to you and saying, thank you, Lord. God, thank you for saving me. Maybe you had parents that passed the faith down to you. God, thank you for Parents who love you and who have passed this on to me. Maybe you had grandparents, a legacy of faith passed down, whatever it is. Thank you, Lord. What are the, the other things since then that God has done where you can say, Lord, thank you. In this time of present wilderness, I can look back. Some of you are like, well, I'm not in the wilderness. Well, I promise you. These times where you're not in wilderness is training for when the wilderness comes. So practice it now. Thank you, Lord. Maybe you need to ask him for that God who provides, to provide a friend that can be that kind of friend that will encourage you in your faith and you in theirs. Maybe a name comes to mind. Lord, give me courage to take that next step. If you're not a Christian, I just invite you to receive the gospel message today. Receive the water of life. And Jesus says you will never thirst again. The gospel message announces that we are, we're sinners, which means we've chosen our way over God's way, and we deserve to be struck. We deserve death for our sin. And Paul says while the wage of sin, the payment we owe for our sin is death, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. That he went up on the cross in my place. He died the death I deserve to die. So my sin is paid for. He rose from the grave to 
declaring victory over sin and death, which means I can have new life in him. Will you receive the gift of life? Are you willing to surrender? Say, God, I, I need you. And everything I have is yours. I'm yours now. My new life, I give it to you. You can pray right there in your own heart and mind. Lord, I believe. I confess my sin. I'm turning from that. I'm choosing to believe. I receive forgiveness and new life in Christ. Lord, I pray that we as a, a people, as a church family, help us, help me and our other pastors to lead this, help us to, to be a people that encourages one another with the testimony of your faithfulness. You're so good. You are faithful. You're a healer. You're a provider. You're the almighty and you are good. You never leave us especially in the wilderness, you're right there. And it's easy to say, I pray, Father, for our hearts, for hearts that will trust. And I thank you for the good work that you've done in those, the testimony of those who have trusted you in the wilderness. Lord, we love you. We thank you for Christ. We praise you. We praise you for the new life we have in him. We praise you we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit until the day of our redemption. We praise you. And we praise you in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. I want you guys to stand. We're going to sing together. And you know, I don't know if you're in wilderness, but somebody within the sound of your voice, good chance they are. And this is what we do together. We testify to the grace of the Lord together. So let's sing praising our God who is faithful to his promises.
uh, what a good song for us to end with. Just, I hope you go out remembering his mercy is more. His mercy is more. Um, we have a, uh, you know, a couple of things just to remind you of. I said during the service group link, connect to a group right out under the trees, um, outside. It's a nice day to do it. Head out there, uh, meet some of our team. They'll tell you more about how to get into a group. Uh, and then please get your ticket online um, for September 22nd. Uh, you can get those online. Do that soon. I get to do one thing today. Um, doesn't know I'm going to do it. Uh, Pastor Jake was supposed to be up here. Uh, but this week, um, Pastor Jake Greer will be celebrating five years of ministry here at Mercy Church. And we just want to thank him. So I'm going to invite Jake and his wife, Meredith. Come on. Yeah, you didn't know we were doing this. Uh, to come up on the stage. And somewhere is a guy named Matthew Esposito. There he is. Um, we have a gift for you. Yeah, you guys welcome them up and thank them again for their service. Um, there is no way I could tell you, uh, we don't have time, I have to have a whole other service to tell you all the things Jake does, uh, and Meredith as well, for Mercy Church, but um, Pastor Jake came in September of 2019, his first full-time vocational ministry gig uh, to serve as our executive pastor, it lasted, you know, a few months, and then COVID hit, and he was thrown into it, um, has served you guys so faithfully and well. He's got broad shoulders, but that's not just physically, that's true of um, his leadership and everyone under his leadership uh, is better for it. And um, he has been a really great friend and partner to me um, in this work here. And I'm just, I'm super grateful and emotional today, um, but grateful for it. So uh, we love you guys. Uh, we want to pray the Lord's blessing over you. You'll, you got a card in there, just a little bit of a, a gift from your church to try and tell you and show you how much we love you in there. Um, but we're going to pray over you. Um, it just thanking the Lord for what he's done, practicing remembrance together. Father, thank you so much for our friends. Thank you for the way you've used Pastor Jake in so many lives. Thank you for the way that the Greers have opened up their homes. And Jake and Meredith have modeled the hospitality of Christ to this church, and we are better for it. We thank you for their leadership. We thank you for the way you've blessed their family. We thank you for their four kiddos uh, and the work you're doing in them. And we pray your blessing over them, Father. We recognize past grace is just a foreshadowing of more to come, and we pray for it. So thank you for our friends. Thank you for our pastor here. Thank you for the way that they have gone first, as we talked about today. We love you. We praise you for them. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Love you. Yep. Love you, brother. Um, Jake is the king of surprises, so anytime you can get him, it's, uh, it's extra special. Got he got him. Um, I'm going to send you guys out with a blessing from Numbers uh, chapter 6. If you want to open up your hands to uh, just posture yourself saying, I'm receiving from the Lord right here. It says, may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord Look with favor on you and give you peace. Mercy Church, in that hope, you are sent.